speakers are Professor Gary Habermas and Professor Craig Keener. Uh, I'm going to open us with a word of prayer. I will then briefly introduce Dr. Habermas, and then he will introduce Dr. Keener uh, because he has far better stories than I do, um, and so it will make for a far more entertaining introduction, I'm sure. Uh, but let me begin with a word of prayer. Please bow with me. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunities we have in this place to gather together freely. We thank you that we can come together and we can listen to those uh, who have listened to you. And so we pray, Lord, that you would transform us even this evening as we listen to the words that are spoken. May these words, Father, transform us insofar as they come from the wisdom that you supply. We ask, Father, that you would give us attentive ears. We pray that you would give us keen minds. And we pray, Lord, that these things would stay with us, that they would change the way we think, and that it would be more in line with what we read and know in your revealed word, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would watch over hearts and minds. I pray that you would strengthen and embolden our speakers this evening that they might speak the truth with conviction, they might speak it with courage, and they might encourage us all in that way, that we might go out from this place and we would speak of Jesus and we would speak of the gospel and we would speak of your truth with that same courage and boldness and conviction. Lord, we pray also that this would be a time in which humility and love and mercy are evident to all because of the presence and power of your Holy Spirit in our midst. We ask now that you would be here with us and you would lead us and guide us in Christ's name. Amen. Before I introduce Dr. Habermas, I would like to say a thank you, a special thank you to Matt Burford. Uh, Matt is the one who, uh, in his nonprofit ministry, uh, has been responsible through tactical faith to uh, bring us together uh, and indeed to invite and to organize these two men to be with us this evening. So thank you very much to Matt and to Tactical Faith for what they have done in, uh, in this gift to Beeson and to all of us. Very briefly, uh, Professor Habermas is probably already known to many of you. Uh, if not, he is a noted apologist who teaches at Liberty University, uh, and he teaches there in the PhD program. It might interest you to know that Professor Habermas came to faith after struggling, uh, <clears throat> about, uh, struggling with the claims of Christianity himself for many years. Among his many pursuits for the truth, Professor Habermas wrestled with a naturalistic worldview, and so as we consider tonight's topic, we recognize that he comes to this topic, he comes to this subject as neither an outsider nor as a latecomer, but as someone who has lived inside of it and found it wanting. In his many travels as a debater and speaker, Professor Habermas has not always been well received, though I trust he will be in our midst including, of course, a time when he was accused of being filled with demons. Having held a brief service of exorcism just a moment ago, we are confident Professor Habermas did not bring any demons with him. I think, I think we're clear. What he will bring, however, is an engaging address on naturalism, which will be followed by an equally engaging address on miracles by our second guest, Dr. Keener. But you did not come here to hear me introduce men. You came to hear what God has revealed to them. And so I turn it over to Professor Habermas. Thank you for being with Thank us. You. Thanks. Good evening. Beautiful place to be uh, sharing tonight. I hope my uh, message comes out as nice as this room is. We'll see. Well, let me make sure I've got this going too. There we go. Okay. Good. Well, as you just heard, uh, years ago I, I did go through a, a period of uh, doubt and struggle. In fact, uh, my brother's here, he pastors in the city here, Keith, at, uh, I have to stop and think about political affiliations and make sure they're at uh, Shades Mountain Baptist Church. And uh, did I get that right? Okay. And uh, you may not even have heard this story before, but I was going through my time of doubt and my mother called me to see how I was doing. And I told her that I thought I was a few months away from becoming a Buddhist. She wasn't impressed. 
we were raised in a German Baptist home and she thought she'd brought us up the right way, I guess. But during that time, I kind of was, was marked, you might say, with kind of a naturalistic mindset. In fact, uh, I don't usually, I mean, there's nothing important about it, but I remember when I first went to Liberty, the chair of the philosophy department who hired me, I'd been there for a few months and I'd been teaching, and he stopped one day and he said, you know something? He said, I think too much of David Hume has rubbed off on you. He said, seriously, um, he said, you'd be thinking about uh, how much you bought into David Hume and your system. Now, just that was 1981. A few years later, very few years later, 88, I published an article on a paradigm shift. And I argued at the time with very few indications that we might be going, undergoing a change of focus today in the uh, Western community. In fact, one of the sources I had read, a very secular source, the first chapter was provocatively entitled, Where Will You Be Standing When the Worldview Shifts? I thought, boy, that's, that is, that, I mean, that is provocative. That's because there were some signs that some things were happening. And as you're going to see in just a few slides from now, some folks are saying that that is even more the case. The same thing that was going on in 1988 is still going on today. And my question is, it seems that naturalism is losing a lot of steam. And in fact, I'll be glad to introduce Craig a little bit later. But Craig reminds us in his two-volume, uh, his excellent book, Miracles, about what you'll be speaking tonight. Um, Craig reminds us over and over again that the Western view is not the majority world view. We call it a world view, but it's not a majority world view. Oftentimes we call what we know in the West as the majority world view, and it's basically what's taught in Western Europe, North America, Australia, and a few other odd places. But naturalism has been crumbling a bit around the edges. Now, I don't mean to argue that just because um, one or two books have come out that things are changing. But I think there's some significance in these books and what they are. Anthony Flew, when I first met him in 1985, and then he and I had our first of three debates that year, he was an atheist, and he was the world's best-known philosophical atheist. There were a triumvirate, there were three of them, and he was the last one who remained alive. Former Oxford graduate, former professor at Oxford, very influential. In fact, it's very possible that Anthony Flew has written more pro-atheistic material than anybody who's ever lived in the world. His dad, by the way, was an evangelical pastor with a doctor's degree from Oxford University. Just an interesting aside. And he said, my dad did not even know that when I went away to school, I had rejected God's existence. And I was an atheist. He, he, Tony and I got to be very close friends, and we phoned and wrote over the intervening years until he passed away just a few years ago. But this book came out just a short time before he died, a few years before he died. And notice the subtitle, How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind. And very creatively, Harper uh, made, wrote the, the title there, There is no God. Whoops, correction. There is a God. As being a sign of what happened to Anthony Flew in his life. Now, in, in 2004, I did an interview with him for the journal Philosophia Christi, philosophy journal, and the article is entitled uh, My Pilgrimage from Atheism to Theism. Now he had actually become a deist, but he didn't want to play that game. He didn't want to argue in the press over what's the difference between, atheism, uh, between theism and deism, so he actually asked me to use the word uh, theism. 
And I interviewed him and I, and I said, Tony, uh, tell our audience, because was, this was all on tape and was transcribed later, what was significant? What played the biggest role? I mean, he wouldn't ever say he was the most published or most whatever atheist of all time. But I, I said, you know, I'm sure people are going to be interested. What can tell us, what can tell us most about you and, and what happened? He said, well, there's two major reasons I gave up my naturalism. And he said, the first one is more important than the second one. He said, the first one is philosophical, the second one is scientific. He said, the philosophical, now how, how it takes a philosopher to say this. When's the last time you've heard somebody say, I was converted because of Aristotle's metaphysics. Say, era who? Uh, Aristotle's metaphysics. And among the questions Aristotle asks, Flew was really interested in the question, why is there something in the universe rather than nothing? Just start with basics. Why is there something rather than nothing? And he was interested in that argument, not from a, a scientific viewpoint so much, but a philosophical argument. His second one was scientific. He had done some reading on intelligent design. Now, I know there's a lot of feeling today against intelligent design, but he found it very persuasive. Uh, Michael Behe, Michael De uh, I mean, uh, Bill Dembski, and a few others. And that was his one-two punch. Now, the press gave a lot more attention to ID in his life, but it was actually the metaphysics that was the most influential. Until the day he died, he was a convinced theist or deist, if you will. People asked me, did he ever become a Christian? And I know he understood Christianity. We talked about it many times. I don't want you to get the wrong idea. Our phone calls weren't evangelistic or all about that. We talk about everything. We talk about politics or what happened in the stock market or the, his wife was Jewish. She was a Jewish atheist. And they made a trip late in their lives to some of the uh, Holocaust uh, sites in Germany and how he was affected by that. That's the things we talk about. But till the day he died, he was a theist. This book came out in 2012. Mind and Cosmos, Why the Materialistic Neo-Darwinian Conception of Nature is Almost Certainly False. Oxford University Press. What if I told you the author, Thomas Nagel, besides being an extremely influential philosopher himself, having a dual post at New York University in philosophy and law, uh, is, is an atheist. In fact, he's famous for a quote some years ago where he says, I don't want to believe in God. I'm not a theist because I don't like the theistic vision of the universe. I don't like what entails. I like to have my freedom. I don't like the other option. That's why I'm an atheist and I dearly hope I'm correct. Well, he still is an atheist. But this book was voted, I'm told, true story, this book was voted the most hated book of 2012. And the reason is because his naturalistic friends, because he's a naturalist, his naturalistic friends said, why are you spilling the beans? Why are you helping folks in trying to point out the fact that there's, there are problems? with our perspective. Why help him along? But it's enough that somebody of his stature would do the writing, that somebody of Oxford's stature would pick this up. And uh, as I said, still an atheist, but this is another sign. I remember years ago, you may remember the name, I don't mean that like he's dead or something, but Michael Denton, a famous Darwinian scholar, and uh, he was a friendly critic of Darwinism, but he was a naturalist and uh, argued for this view all the time. And then just recently, somebody sent me something and I said, whoa, Michael Denton, senior fellow of the Discovery Institute? Intelligent Design, the Intelligent Design Think Tank of the Northwest? Did some checking, found out that the same Michael Denton. Here I review the claim that the order of nature is uniquely suitable for life as it exists on earth. 
and specifically for living beings similar to modern humans, I show that none of the recent advances significantly undermine the core argument that nature is peculiarly, peculiarly fit for carbon-based Terran life. And this is one of several critiques he's published in a peer-reviewed biology journal arguing for a different look at design and the universe. Several years ago in 2008, this was the article, I, I could have put it up there first, but this was the one that really kind of got me thinking about this. And I should tell you this up front so you understand what I'm going to say about the article. I was lecturing in, in Europe a few years ago, and I was talking about this article, and a fellow in the front row was an Oxford, sorry, Cambridge professor, and he said, do you know who David Brooks is? And I said, I do not. He said, well, David Brooks is um, a good friend of mine. And he said, I'll just tell you, he's not a Christian. And you need to keep that in mind when you're reading his things. No, so keep that in mind. He wrote a book, you can get this online, the article, The Neural Buddhist in the New York Times, right? Not a conservative newspaper. And he's talking about the revolution that's happening right now. The cognitive revolution is not going to end up undermining faith in God. It's going to end up challenging faith in the Bible, and I'll explain that in a moment. But it's not going to end up going against God. Don't forget what naturalism is. Naturalism, I should have defined it from the beginning. The natural world, the na and sorry, naturalism is a philosophical worldview that says the natural world is all there is, and basically we know what we know by the scientific method. Uh, and uh, it, but by definition, it says there's no supernatural. Over the past several years, the momentum has shifted away from hardcore materialism. Orthodox believers are going to have to defend particular doctrines and particular biblical teachings. They're going to have to defend the idea of a personal God and explain why specific theologies are true guides for behavior day to day. But he says, let's keep in mind, we're in the middle of a scientific revolution. It's going to have big cultural effects. Something's happening. Now, why does he say it's going to challenge faith in the Bible? Because as the, the article hints, the neural Buddhists, it hints that he's talking about something that neither Christians nor naturalists, I mean, you can be a naturalistic Buddhist, but something that neither side's going to be terribly comfortable with. And he argues that in the world today, naturalism is losing ground. We're in the middle of a scientific revolution. Momentum is shift away from hardcore materialism. And he says, this is really where I got the title of the, the talk. He says, something's going on, and we need to see what's going to take the place of the worldview that's dominated Western thought for generations. And he says, I think the two biggest takers, I think the two most likely views to step into this void, on the one hand, is what he calls neural Buddhism. Neural Buddhism in 2008 is what I would have called 20 years earlier in the article I wrote, A Paradigm Shift that Challenged to Naturalism. We would have called, in Christian circles, we probably would have called what he calls neural Buddhism um, New Age views. And he says, now he says, here's the problem with New Age views and what he, he doesn't talk about Christianity what he calls the biblical tradition. So I guess this would be the Judeo-Christian tradition. He doesn't really define all of this. And he says, who's going to step into the void left by the downfall of naturalism? And he says, now here's why the biblical view has problems. On the one hand, they both might say, God? Yeah, I'm okay with God. Worship? Cool, yeah, that's all right. Prayer? Prayer, meditation, yeah, something like that. Sounds good. Afterlife? Yeah, afterlife is fine. Both views are religious, he's saying. But to say it in theological or philosophical terms, 
Brooks argues that Christianity has something in addition to these general religious truths. Christians have what we call special revelation. We believe God has spoken. And because we believe God has spoken, and because we believe that what we get in Scripture is God's word for us, therefore, we have bigger territory to cover and defend than they do. Besides, the things they believe, we share. God? Check. Worship? Check. Prayer? Yeah. Ethics? Absolutely. Afterlife? Sure. Trinity? <laughs> right. Okay. Whatever. Salvation by what? <laughs> atonement? <laughs> I didn't even get past the word salvation, let alone atonement. No, we're all children of God. Oh, well, that's a difference. How about the Bible's the word of God? <laughs> What'd you say? No, we're all children of God. I mean, this almost sounds like some of the stuff from the 60s, but it really hasn't gone anywhere. Again, we call it New Age. And so, so David Brooks is saying, you folks in the biblical tradition, you have a bigger base of knowledge, but you can't just sit there. You have to defend particular doctrines and particular biblical teaching. So my question is, if Brooks is right, if some of the rest of these writers are right, if Nagel's right, if Tony Flew is right, if uh, Michael Denton is right, are we really going to have to, is there, is there going to be a clash of worldviews, or is the book I started out with, where will you be standing when the worldview shift, when the paradigm shifts? If we see that in our time, who's going to have the leg up? Are we going to be able to defend our doctrines? What I'd like to do for the rest of this lecture is to argue that a number of things have been suggested to indicate that naturalism is incorrect. Now, this is not a philosophical critique of naturalism. Maybe somebody wants to pursue that during the Q&A tonight. But I'd like to give 10 indications from recent research Somebody, a number of major papers, let's say, will support each of these 10. That doesn't mean everyone's going to like them. In fact, I gave this lecture recently. I was in uh, Sweden, and I gave uh, what was a pretty interesting trip. I was, introdu I was introduced, they, they said frequently, welcome to the most liberal country in the world. And then they'd tell people what I was going to speak on. And one topic that I kept getting asked to speak on over and over again was this lecture, this void of naturalism. What are we going to put in its place? And I was asked to speak at a medical school in Gothenburg. I was thinking like Batman or something, you know. But um, it was a medical school, and the students, about 100 of them, were real kind of excited. It was kind of the, the lecture I gave, I gave 42 of them in two weeks. Uh, it was probably the one that was the most cheerfully received by the people in this most liberal country in the world. And one of them came up and said this to me afterwards. I can't say I liked all ten of your reasons. I was all ready to raise my hand and object and say, yeah, I don't buy that one. But the problem is you had ten, and I couldn't explain away the ten. So if you think about his, his comment there, I'm going to divide this list into four suggestions that some supernatural realm is here today, not necessarily um, miraculous. In fact, the neuro-Buddhist could say amen to a lot of these things. And then a half dozen, the remainder of the ten, indications that Christianity may be true. So... The odd person out in this lecture is, as you can tell, is naturalism. And the question is, taking up David Brooks's challenge, who remains in the discussion? Is it the neuro-Buddhist or is it the Judeo-Christian tradition? Okay, I'm going to go through these first four uh, a little bit more quickly. I'm just going to put them up here. Cosmology. I remember the program that Nightline did 
uh, about 20 years ago, where they came on one night with an astrophysicist, and they were breaking the news, which we take largely for granted today, but this astrophysicist was saying, don't ask me too many questions, I don't know, but we know there was a big bang. And I know what you religious people are thinking, if the universe came into being at a point in time, what's before that point? He said, all I can tell you is, if space, time, matter, energy are born at the Big Bang, then you can't ask questions of before because there's no before. But, that, but you know what people are saying. Do you get, get the time language out of there. Where did it come from? C.S. Lewis has a, fam a famous line, if there ever was a time when nothing existed, nothing would exist now. So, cosmological questions. These two are very similar, but I have a couple things in here that make the even number 10, so I, I had to kind of break them up. S some, Anthony Flew, most of the people I was talking about earlier, Anthony Flew and, um, uh, well, actually, almost every person I mentioned there at the beginning, including Michael Denton, uh, all argued that intelligent design should be studied, at the very least, fine-tuning. This is the part that Denton was arguing in the article. This is one that I have done a lot of work on myself, second only to the resurrection. This is the area I've, I've done the most studies on since the early 1970s. And if you've ever come across evidence for religious views, and again, I think the neural Buddhists will say amen to this. This doesn't say anything about Christian revelation. This is not, in fact, I've said regularly in publications, near-death experiences are non-worldview specific. They don't help you choose which worldview is right. They do help you point out that naturalism looks like it's mistaken, but it doesn't tell you what takes its place. But if you've not heard this before, I'll only be able to introduce it, don't have time to go into detail. Sometimes I'm asked to give the whole lecture on this, and that's fine. But near-death experiences have been written up in more than 20 different medical journals in our society, peer-reviewed secular medical journals. Some of them are to be critical. Some of them are to be positive. In fact, a scientific publisher just brought out a book just a few years ago, uh, one of the latest of many, many publications on near-death experiences, and the editor of the Journal of Near-Death Studies, which is the only peer-reviewed near-death research journal in the world. She, she's a professor at North Texas University. She does an article summarizing the results of 100 evidential near-death cases. Near-death cases. We now know, for example, if you have a cardiac arrest, not like heart arrhythmia, but a cardiac arrest, you are you have no measurable heart activity and no measurable brain activity within 20 seconds so a person who reports something beyond let's say the 30 second mark is reporting potentially reporting something that's very um, remarkable if they can tell you well i passed out right here and they got the paramedics in here on campus, but I kind of drifted up and, uh, you know, I watched a car accident out here. I mean, did you guys hear a boom? I can tell you what happened. I don't know why that stupid guy went through the stop sign, but he did. And you were in here when the person passed out. This is not an actual case. I'm just giving you an example. And you know what time they passed out. You know what time the paramedic said, you know, that resuscitated. And that came in the middle of it. But if they don't have any measurable heart activity, don't have any measurable brain activity, how are they knowing what happened out there, especially if they told you as soon as they came to? Now what's going on? But NDEs are non-worldview specific because they don't tell you, even if they say, I went away and I went through a tunnel and I saw, that's not confirmable material. That's... That's their supposition of what happened afterwards. But the only things that are measurable are this worldly things. And uh, there's a lot of these. I can talk about any number of these. But 
this one might be the one that gets a lot of the attention because it's the most difficult to refute in terms of evidence. But it doesn't say Christianity is true, far from it. It just says something religious is going on. And I would argue that near-death experiences reveal a supernatural realm, but not a miraculous realm. I think the supernatural events, not miraculous, not direct intervention of God. It's just what happens when you die. All right. The last six, which I also won't be spending a lot of time on, but these are six indications that Christianity is true. The next one, I'm glad Craig's here tonight, because... I'm going to be going through this one very quickly. But the first time Craig's seen this PowerPoint, and every time I give it, I talk about Craig Keener. And so I'm glad Craig Keener's here tonight. And I won't talk about it, because then he can't be critical of what I say and if I get the story right. Um, but Craig Keener's done a lot of work on, as he counts it, Craig, let me get this right, hundreds of millions of medical reports of miracles in the world today. Did I say that right? Surveys indicate. All we are is on the bare testimony level. We're not talking proof. We're not talking, you know. Surveys show, indicate, hundreds of millions of miraculous testimonies around the world. Fair? And Craig's book, I've been pressing them. I don't know how many cases are in there. There's at least hundreds. There might be more than a thousand. But some of these are... Demonstrable. I'll let him tell you about that. But what do you do when you have pre and post CAT scans, pre and post MRIs, pre and post X rays? He's got a fair number of um, cases like that. In fact, because I lecture on his material, I even have a list of some of these real miraculous ones. I told Craig I brought it. Craig's not even seen it. But I'll be glad to give it to somebody here who can pass it out to anybody who's interested, in, has a, who wants to see a copy of. I think a couple dozen cases. Okay, double-blind prayer experiments. Another example of something I needed to have one to hit 10. There's, there's some issues with this research. Right now it's in its infancy. There are some issues. Not all prayer experiments are created equal. Um, in one prayer experiment, if you were prayed for, the chances were less than 50-50 that you would have gotten better. In fact, you'd probably get worse. Say, well, man, I'm glad that's not my pastor. Oh, no, your pastor was in that study. No, I'm just kidding. Um, in fact, in some of these studies, most interestingly, they didn't get any Christian pastors. They got Native American witch doctors. They got sorcerer, people who are into sorcery and voodoo. They got Buddhist priests. Because, I mean, you know, you know the old excuse. There are so many Christians in this country. Go ask one of them. We're trying to give everybody else a chance. And then the prayers aren't answered. Now, I want to make something really, really clear. I think God answers prayers for unbelievers. I think it's very clear that that happens. So I'm not making that point. And let me just, on the side here. When Jesus went to towns, when he went to cities to heal, and sometimes he healed, it says, everyone who came to him before he preached, he didn't walk up to him before he preached and said, Christian, you are? You're healed. Hey, yes, healed. Hey, no, get out of here. All right, you, yeah, yes, you're healed. You, no, what are you, Buddhist or something? Get out of here. Jesus never did that. He didn't even ask them what they believed. He just healed everybody in sight. Now, that's not the same as an answer of prayer, but God was doing, if you believe the Christian view, God is doing what they wanted. They would come to them as a, please, heal me, and Jesus healed them. I think that's the best example of God working in the lives of unbelievers. And so I think God does that. But it's not my fault if the only person double-blind prayer experiments that I'm familiar with are ones where all the prayers were Orthodox Christians. And they're the only ones that got high rates of answers, enough so that they've been written up that, as far as I know, in two peer-reviewed secular medical journals, they've written these results, 
And uh, the precy for one of them actually says this, the precy, the little paragraph summary at the beginning of the article, says, the results of this prayer experiment are consistent with prayer to the Judeo-Christian God. Now that was in the late 80s. I don't think you're going to find too many uh, medical journals using those words today. But that's in the literature. You can get it. The author's name is Randolph Byrd, by the way, B-Y-R-D, Southern Medical Journal. Now, Craig says in the book, he says, you may very well find a lot of this among unbelievers, but my research is among Christians. He just simply didn't answer the question. I'm not saying you won't be able to find this, for, but if it's for non-Christians too, if you get a lot of this data, this moves over to the other category. You know what I mean? It's evidence that naturalism is wrong, but it wouldn't be necessarily be specific evidence that Christianity's right. This is a change. When I went to grad school in the 1970s, if you said, I think Jesus did miracles and did exorcisms, they'd probably say, first of all, you're naive. Secondly, you've got to be an evangelical. And of course, evangelicals are naive, so they go together. That's what they probably would have told me in Michigan State. But I, didn't, I never had a professor, as far as I know, who believed that Jesus did miracles. Today, it's almost unanimous in the New Testament guild. Now, here's the question they don't generally answer. Was he really doing supernatural events? Marcus Borg, for example, fairly far to the left, co-founder of Jesus Seminar. Marcus Borg says, I don't know. I don't think we know if Jesus could have or did actually raise Lazarus. I, I don't know. I'm not, I can't answer that question. But what I will tell you is this. There are many incidents in the Gospels, and this pretty much states the modern view. There are many incidents in the Gospels which are historically accurate, that what Jesus does in these passages, whether healing or exorcisms, because critical scholars count exorcisms as a species of miracle. You have natural miracles, healing miracles, and exorcisms are the three categories. And they'll say Jesus did those things. But if you're going to take a new look at Jesus today, that's going to include miracles, you say, well, oh, no, wait a minute. Could we find, like your previous category and the one before that, could we find other founders of major world religions who are miracle workers? Here's the problem. Edwin Yamauchi, very well known, just recently retired from the University of, of uh, Miami in Ohio, uh, history department. He says that there are no founders of major world religions in addition to Jesus, none, who report, of whom miracles are reported within a generation of them being done. No one else. I have a book on my shelf called The Buddhist Scriptures by a Buddhist scholar, PhD. He starts the book like this. This book is about Buddha. But I want to remind my readers, it's just like page one or two. I just want to remind my readers, if you're familiar with the Christian tradition, don't expect that in the Buddhist tradition. Christians have the words of their Lord. We don't have the words of our Lord. Christians have the words of the disciples of the Lord. We don't have the words of the disciples of our Lord. They have the words of the disciples of the disciples of the Lord. We don't have the words of the disciples of the disciples of our Lord. That's how he starts. Don't expect the kind of wealth that Christianity has. Then when you flip over a few chapters and it's called the words of our Lord, Buddha, here's how the chapter starts again. I remind you, we don't have the words of our Lord, but let's just talk about what different traditions say he taught. That's different. So we have Jesus, according to the contemporary reports, who's a miracle worker. This is very, very recent. You definitely couldn't have said this in the 70s. You couldn't even probably have said this in the 90s. But lately, there's been a trend, including an article by a good friend of ours, Mike Lacona, in the non-evangelical, peer-reviewed New Testament journal, the study, study for this, uh, I mean, journal for the study of the historical Jesus. Mike gives six reasons that Jesus predicted his miracles ahead of time. That may not sound like a big thing to you, but, but watch how important this is for a worldview. If Jesus predicts his resurrection ahead of time, it's one thing to do it. It's something else to know 
the biggest miracle in the history of religions has happened before it happens. You know what that proves? See, if you rise from the dead, that just shows you rose from the dead. If you told everybody you're going to rise from the dead, then you rose from the dead. What that shows is most likely there's a plan going on here. You're part of a theistic plan. Uh, what kind of plan? Theist. Uh, oh, so God's involved. Yeah. And how many times does this happen? As far as we know, once. Only with Jesus. So we have a miracle worker who predicted his resurrection, who was raised from the dead. This is the area where I do most of my research. The field has totally changed on this. So much so that if you do a head count of contemporary scholars, more contemporary scholars today believe something actually happened to Jesus after his death than those who believe nothing happened. This is not a naturalistic universe. In fact, I'll just give you one finding. It's very, very recent. Christians have been saying for a long time, we often argue like this, well, come on, the Gospels are only 30, 40 years later, beginning at that time. That's pretty early for a, a report. That is pretty early. But then we realize we can get all the way back to the 30s with some sermon summaries in Acts and some creedal passages in the New Testament. Let Dr. Keener define those for you since he's written a length on them. And Bart Ehrman, the best-known agnostic in the U.S., said in his most recent book, he said, we have reports of the resurrection of Jesus. We have reports that go back to no later than one to two years after the cross. For all those people who say the reports are way too late, they're not too late if they're even the Gospels. But Bart Ehrman, agnostic, who even says at the beginning of his book, he says, don't get upset with me, he's writing to non-Christians. He says, don't get upset with me if you're saying this, I'm not even a Christian. And we can get these reports back to one to two years from the cross. Lastly, I'll just kind of put a plug in your ear. I, I've been, uh, I wrote two books, co-author with the Shroud. My co-author was one of the scientists who did the original 1978 study. I'll just say, don't, I, I'm, I'm not sure we know what the Shroud is, but don't be too quick to rule it out. This might be the real thing. And the two latest tests that came out one year ago, one, reduced the, one reversed the carbon dating of 1988 and said that the shroud is plus or minus 250 years, plus or minus first century AD. And second, the image on the shroud is an image caused by radiation of a man who was crucified and buried in this cloth. We have hundreds of cloths in existence. None of them have anything but, but blood and decomposition. Why do we have an image of a crucified man who looks like all the classical pictures of Jesus and it looks like radiation is coming from a, a dead body? One of the chief members of the Shroud team, a Yale professor, told me years ago, the image is as if there were millions of micro lasers in every pore of the skin scorching the cloth simultaneously but the man in the cloth is dead. What's happening right precisely at this moment where he's dead, but energy is coming out? And then this professor went on to say, if the amount of energy that we have on the shroud were converted to nuclear energy, it would have leveled the city of Jerusalem. What do we do with these? Now, I'm not, say, I'm not acting like all these are done deals. I'm not saying the jury's in. I'm just saying, remember where I went at the beginning, things look like they're shifting. That's my theme. Not, they've already shifted, they're done, we know what this means. No, I don't know what I think about the shroud. And I don't know, I don't know about some of these other things. I don't know about double-blind prayer experiments. I'm not positive. If they start finding uh, documented miracle claims of other religions, we'll have to think about what that means. I've already conceded these things. I'm just saying it looks like naturalism is out. There is a supernatural world. And if David Brooks is right of the New York Times, we're in this to argue who can best attest the worldview 
that'll be moving in and taking over. Do we have a break or do I just introduce them right away and go right ahead? I go right ahead. Very good. Um, I don't even know how to turn this thing off. I know how to do it on my computer, but I don't want to mess somebody else's up. I'll just let you play with that. All right. Well, let me introduce a good friend of mine, Dr. Craig Keener. I, you know what? Craig is such a humble guy, and I mean this sincerely. Craig is such a humble guy that if I told you some of the stories I do know about him, he would just sit here and probably wilt and tell me I wish he hadn't said those things. Yes, he's, he's extremely humble. This guy makes all of us in the profession embarrassed to say we write books because he writes in about a week what I write in a month. Seriously, if I write three to four pages in a day, I'm on top of the world. I asked Craig just a few months ago, how many pages do you write in a day? He said, I'd say probably 20. I don't know anybody in our fields who write 20 pages a day, except Craig. And just one story. Craig was under contract to write a commentary in the book of Acts. He just told us over dinner tonight, it was supposed to be about 1,000 pages. They asked communicated him after this book. Because his first volume, introduction and the first two chapters, was over 1,000 pages long. As someone said at the dinner table tonight, that's more than Luke wrote. <laughs> Craig, are all four volumes done now? They're done. They're just waiting to come out. And the book's going to be a little over 4,000 pages. Luke's was inspired, and his isn't. But his commentary in Acts was 7,000 manuscript pages. And by the way, his two books, 1,100 pages on miracles, that's an addendum, that's a footnote to the Acts book, because he was into the Acts book when he started doing the miracles to try to say, are the things that Luke explains in the book of Acts still happening today? So this guy, seriously, is a scholar, scholar, the New Testament scholars in the world love Craig and his work because it's a careful kind of work that we all wished we had time to go through. And he not only teaches a full load at Asbury Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky, but he does the writing too. You tell him how you write. He writes all night, then he teaches during the day. He's going to come up and talk to us today about modern day miracles. Did the things that happened in the book of Acts, did they really happen? And what does that say about the world we live in? Correct? Uh, here, here it goes. Um, can we can we uh, applaud Gary? Because of the transition, we didn't get to. I am uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that introduction, but the 20 pages a day, that's only in the time that I'm actually writing. There's also time when I go back and um, edit what I wrote and then you know, indexing and so on. So it's not like every day I'm writing 20 pages, but. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful that I got to do the Miracles book. I, I was. Um, it did start as a footnote, and I wasn't really planning to turn it into a book. I, I thought somebody else had written the book that it turned out being, and when I didn't find one initially, then I ended up doing more, and it grew and grew, and eventually it was too long for a footnote, so, uh, so we moved on, but thanks be to God. Uh, is this forward? Oh, pointed at the computer. Maybe it doesn't work on a Mac. Uh, I don't know. Oh, maybe, let's see. Uh, <laughs> it's changing yours. It's not changing mine. 
Okay. In, 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 no, it's all right. In the meantime, I'm going to, to forward this one uh, this way. David Friedrich Strauss was very much influenced by David Hume, who was mentioned earlier. Uh, this is nothing to pick on people named David. My, my son is named David. But David Friedrich Strauss believed that you couldn't really trust the miracle stories in the Gospels and Acts, that they arose by the process of, of legendary accretion. Thank, thanks so much. Ah, it was right set up. Um, he, didn't, he didn't believe that they would come from eyewitnesses. These were things that grew over time as a result of legend. Interestingly, there was a German Lutheran pastor by the name of Johann Christoph Blumhardt who prayed for a friend of Strauss. Uh, Strauss's friend was disabled, he couldn't walk. After Blumhardt prayed for him, he could walk. Now Strauss said, ah, he must have just been psychosomatically unable to walk. It's interesting, however, he didn't say this report only arose as a result of legendary accretion. And that's part of what I wanted to challenge in my book on miracles, to show that at the very least, however you explain them, you can't say that these things arose by legend because eyewitnesses today claim the same range of events as we have in the Gospels apart from the resurrection of Jesus. But there's also the issue of, um, of why he said that, and that was because he was working from anti-supernaturalistic presuppositions, depending on David Hume. Um, Hume regarded miracles as, a, as violations of natural law, which is probably deliberately provocative language. He was condensing a lot of arguments from, from uh, deists who had come before him. But I'm going to skip some of this material and focus especially on Hume's argument about witnesses, which is kind of the, the focus of where his argument goes. Hume was very much into arguing that we should think inductively, but his argument is not at all inductive. He says that human experience shows us that miracles can't happen. Well, what happens when you have well-supported eyewitness claims for miracles? He says, well, we know that those can't be true because miracles cannot be shown to have happened because... Uh, thus he dismissed Jansenist reports who were an easy target for him because they were too uh, Augustinian for the Jesuits in France and they were too Catholic for the Protestants. But uh, if you've heard of Blaise Pascal, his niece had, a, had an open running eyesore that emitted a foul odor. And she, was, uh, sh she had had this for a long time. She was instantly and publicly healed and the Queen Mother of France even sent her physician to check it out. Hume points to this, he says, well look, we have a report of this, it's far better documented than anything we have in the New Testament, and yet we know this couldn't have happened, so why would we believe anything in the New Testament? And that's his argument. There have been a number of recent major philosophic challenges to human miracles published by Cambridge, Cornell, Oxford and so on. The, the book by John Ehrman, someone critiqued it saying, you just say this because you're Christian, to which Ehrman responded, I'm not a Christian. I just thought Hume had a bad argument. Hume's principle of uniformity, the past is not different from today. Uh, it was actually developed more fully by Ernst Trolch. But Today, the principle of analogy is more likely to support healings in the Gospels as we have a fuller knowledge of reports around the world than Hume did. Although the reports that Hume did have or could have had from around the world, he probably would have dismissed because of his monocultural prejudices. Hume said that only ignorant and barbarous nations affirm miracles. If somebody said this today, we'd call them an ethnocentric bigot, uh, which in fact, Hume basically was. Hume doubted exceptional persons of color. He, he talked about this one Jamaican. He says, oh yeah, uh, it's said that he can, he can recite poetry, but any parrot can repeat what it hears. The Jamaican to whom he was referring was Francis Williams, who composed poetry in English and in Latin. I, I would consider that pretty smart. Um, Bultmann was not necessarily coming from direct ethnocentric prejudice like Hume. I mean, Hume was, 
was used by his successors in support of slavery, is how, is how far Hume went. But Bultmann, um, I think Bultmann just didn't know about some of the, the claims around the world. He said the modern world, nobody in the modern world believes in miracles. And I brought this up with one of my professors who was a Bultmannian. I said, you know, Bultmann's approach to this, without offering any argument, just saying nobody in the modern world believes in miracles, case closed, excludes from the modern world all traditional Jews, Christians, Muslims, traditional tribal religionists, two-thirds of the graduate students sitting around this table, basically everybody except his mid-20th century uh, Western academic elite. He said modern people don't believe in miracles, at least mature modern people. Husto Gonzalez, by contrast, citing Latino churches, declares what Boltmann declares to be impossible is not just possible but even frequent. Philip Jenkins has documented it throughout the global south and, and there are a number of other works that have made this case. But even in the United States, a 2008 Pew Forum survey suggested that 34% of Americans claim to have witnessed or experienced divine or supernatural healing. Now, the point is not what proportion of these claims we would necessarily call miracles. Uh, wherever we stand, none of us would call all of them really miracles. But the point is whether Hume can legitimately start from the premise that nobody in the modern world, well, Bultmann's premise, nobody in the modern world believes in miracles or Hume's, that uniform human experience rules out miracle claims. The claims can hardly be the human experience can hardly be uniform on the point, or we can at least hardly start with that assumption when we have so many contrary claims. How widespread are healing claims? Well, if we start from the churches that are particularly known for that emphasis among Pentecostal and charismatic circles, there was a, another Pew Forum survey that was done of 10 countries, especially Pentecostals and charismatics in these 10 countries. And in these 10 countries alone, and among Pentecostals and Charismatics in these 10 countries alone, the estimated total of these people claiming to have witnessed divine healings, again, this is 10 countries alone and Pentecostals and Charismatics alone, comes out to around 200 million people. And that's not even including the Charismatic Catholics, that was just the Protestant Catholics. What may be more surprising to most people today is that among the other Christians in those 10 countries alone, around 39% claim to have witnessed divine healing. So perhaps over one third of Christians worldwide who do not identify themselves as Pentecostal or charismatic claim to have witnessed divine healings. Often this occurs most dramatically in areas uh, uh, that are groundbreaking evangelism areas. Um, J.P. Moreland has pointed out that about 80% of church growth in the, in the past 20 years has been due to signs and wonders around the world. China was not among the 10 countries in the survey that we just noted, but a report from, the, uh, from within the official China Christian Council affiliated with the Three Self Church about 10 years ago reported that half of the new conversions of the last 20 years have been caused, caused by faith healing experiences. Some of the sources within the house church movement in rural areas suggest closer to 90%. Now, I can't tell you exactly what percentage it actually was, but the point is, overall, we're talking about millions of people to whom we cannot attribute Christian prejudice starting out. These are people who were not Christians, who abandoned and changed centuries of tradition because they believed that they or somebody close to them had been healed and it wasn't just some sort of recovery that they saw on a regular basis. This was something they considered dramatic. Um, in India, in Chennai, there was a study done a number of years ago when it was called Madras um, and 10% of the non-Christians there said that they had been healed in answer to Christian prayer in the name of Jesus. Uh, at least 10% 10, 10 of those that were interviewed and about 30% said that they knew somebody who had been so healed. Um, I'm going to be giving examples. Uh, I'm giving just a few examples. Obviously, there are many, many more in the book, but I'm going to try to, uh, to get it into the time frame. I'm going to be moving quickly through a number of them. 
Um, these examples are examples from people I've interviewed, especially people I know personally, or I know somebody who knows them personally, or I have other very good reasons to trust their reliability. One principle that I'm following is that a smaller number of witnesses should be counted more heavily than a larger number of skeptical non-eyewitnesses. For example, if there's a traffic accident and the police officer pulls over the, uh, in, uh, starts interviewing the people who witnessed the accident and the witnesses are saying, well, this happened, this happened, and then somebody says, no, that didn't happen. And the police officer says, well, well, sir, what did you see? And the person says, well, I didn't see anything. That's why I know it didn't happen. That's, that's really not a good basis for determining what happened. So, you know, it's, we, we don't count heads about how many people say things didn't happen. We are more interested in what eyewitnesses claim to have happened, which is what we have to do with historical documents. It's what we have to do with the New Testament. So I'm going to start first with the account of Therese Magnuha. I actually have some more dramatic accounts than this but um, this one was one that was particularly moving to me for reasons that you will soon understand. When she was about two years old, she cried out that she had been bitten by a snake. And her mother found her not breathing. There was no medical help available in the village, so she strapped the child to her back, and she ran to a nearby village where a family friend, Coco Ngoma Moise, was doing ministry. And Coco Moise prayed for her, and Therese started breathing again. And the next day she was fine. So I asked the mother, how long was it that Therese was not breathing? And she had to stop and think about going up this hill and down that hill, you know, get, getting from the one village to the next. She said, about three hours. Now, you know, six minutes with no oxygen causes irreparable brain damage. But she's now finished her master's degree in a seminary in Cameroon. And this really touched me because Therese is my wife's sister, and the witness is my mother-in-law. And also, um, we, did, we did check with Coco Moise, who was still alive at the time. Uh, and, and over in that corner, the, the very lovely one is my wife. Many church fathers claimed to be eyewitnesses of healings and exorcisms that were converting many polytheists. In fact, Ramsey McMullen, and he seemed reluctant about this in an interview I heard, but, but he documents that in the third and fourth centuries, the leading cause of conversion to Christianity was healings and exorcisms. And it, it continued through the, through the later church. Uh, there are a number of stories we could tell from Augustine. Augustine originally believed these things had died out for the most part. But he retracted that later on in his writings. City of God 22.8, he gives a, 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 a list of miracles that had happened in his own diocese, uh, some things that he had witnessed or experienced. I uh, talked about uh, within the diocese healings of blindness, raisings from the dead, and so on, that they had collected over 70 affidavits of different uh, healing claims, and he knew of other people who hadn't turned in the data. I'm going to just concentrate on certain kinds of healing claims for the sake of time, but we have a, a large number of reports of healings of blindness. And I don't want you to get the wrong idea. We have far more people who haven't been healed of it than who have been healed of it, but uh, that's... That's a different kind of subject. We're talking about, about miracles. So um, one of the accounts I have, uh, one, of my, one of my students at a Baptist seminary where I taught, before I taught at Asbury, was um, Paul Mokake, who did his master's degree there and then his, his D-men. And he had a number of reports for me, but um, he had gone back to, back to Cameroon. And one of our other students, Yolanda McCain, who was from Philadelphia, went to visit Cameroon, and she was there when Paul prayed for someone who was blind, and they were able to see. And so she came back, and she was telling us about it. So I asked Paul, and he said, oh, yeah. Um, but he had so many stories. There are a number of cases where eyes white from cataracts. We have eyewitnesses who saw them instantly healed. We, we also have um, some publicly documented a publicly acknowledged, medically documented cases where eye scarring disappeared. This is Dr. Kato. He's the president of Shalom University in Bunya, 
the DRC, uh, Congo DRC. And we were doing some work on ethnic reconciliation together. So I asked him uh, one day, since I was working on the Miracles book, by the way, do you have any miracle stories? He said, well, yeah, years ago, when we were out doing evangelism in a village, a few of us, they brought to us a woman who was, who was, who was blind. And so we were asked to pray for her, and we'd never done that before. But we said, well, we came that God's name might be glorified. So let's just pray and see what God might do. And they started praying. And after about two minutes, this woman who was, he thinks, in her 60s, she's, she started shouting, I can see, I can see, and began dancing around. Um, and she remained sighted for the rest of her life. A friend of mine, Flint McLaughlin, who w was director of the Cambridge Business Institute, he was uh, in India with some other people. I consulted uh, one of them as well. And he prayed for a blind man with clouded eyes. And the man was instantly healed. This is the field where he ran in circles praising God. And here is where the man began to weep as he was coming to give his testimony that night. And someone asked him, why are you weeping? He said, I've always heard the voices of the children, but I'd never seen them before. I'm going to give some accounts of raisings from the dead, uh, because normally people don't consider people to be psychosomatically dead. <clears throat> So I'm just going to give a few samples. Uh, there are some of these in the Church Fathers. Uh, Wesley in his journal. Now this is not something that was recorded a long time later. This is recorded at the time of the events. He prayed for somebody, Mr. Myrick, that he believed was dead, and the man came back. Uh, we, have, we have scores of these testimonies. Obviously, again, most people who die stay dead, but this is just saying we, we do have some exceptions. A pastor in Mumbai shared with me this, and this isn't one of the strongest cases, but since I'm using PowerPoint, I'm using the ones where I have pictures. So believers found a Hindu boy, Vikram, lying at the bottom of a pool at a retreat center where they were visiting. And so two of them took him to a hospital where they pronounced him dead. They took him to another hospital where they also pronounced him dead. But an hour and a half later, they came back. Uh, while the believers were all praying, they came back with the boy alive. And these pictures are from him after they brought him back alive. He said that he heard the name Jesus and then was rescued. His Hindu parents said he's never heard that name before. And this is a picture of them joining in the worship service of the Christians afterwards. This is a testimony. It's not featured very much in the Miracles book because I met the person afterwards. Um, this is uh, Yusuf Herman, and I have this picture, because he's the one who put me in touch with this other person. Uh, he knows the person very well. But I put this picture first to remind me, to warn you that if you get queasy at the sight of blood, you need to close your eyes uh, until further notice, or at least until uh, you can tell I've moved on to another topic and forgot to tell you. This is uh, a person you can see he was dead. His, his neck was cut. Um, Actually, they'd moved his body. There was more blood in the field where he was. But they, they cut his throat. The way they were transporting him to the hospital, obviously, was not very good for a body that would be alive either. These were pictures from the news. Uh, I had the, the news report, and I uh, took, took these out of the news report. Uh, in this case, it required medical intervention. But he had, a, he had an, an NDE. <laughs> He had an experience of heaven, and then um, um, when they were getting ready to pronounce him dead and send him to the morgue, he said, I'm still alive. And they said, oh. And so they, they started working on sewing back his neck. Uh, I, was, I was giving some of these accounts, and I have so many, so many more of these, but for the sake of time, I was giving some of these accounts at a Society of Biblical Literature meeting where I was not trying to persuade people of the supernatural. I was simply saying, you know, our, our reading strategies Maybe we could learn something from the majority world where they don't find these an embarrassment, but they can resonate more with these stories that we have in the New Testament because, look, we have stories like this today. And after I'd finished, um, Ayo Adewuya, who's a professor now in the U.S., but he's from Nigeria originally, he stood up in the back and he said, I have one of those stories. 
my son was stillborn, and the midwife and I prayed for 30 minutes, and my son came back to life. And his son has now finished a Master of Science degree at the University of London. Again, no brain damage in any of these cases, no brain damage. Another, another account, uh, just because I was working the Miracles book, I thought, well, you know, I worked together with Leo Bawo when I was in Nigeria, and I know he did a lot of research. He traveled around. I wonder if he had any miracle stories. So I asked him. He said, well, just a few. One of the ones he gave me was where he was doing ministry in a, in a village and the neighbors of his host brought over their, their son, who apparently had just died. And he, he took their child, prayed for a couple hours, and handed, handed the child back to the family alive. There are a number of examples from Congo Brazzaville, um, which is where my wife is from, uh, including from the president of the largest uh, de Protestant denomination there, uh, Eglise Evangelique de Congo. Um, I could give a lot of these, but for the, oh, actually, I'm doing fine. All right, uh, let, me, let me give you one of these. Albert Besuesue was a school inspector in the north of Congo. All these, all these testimonies from Congo, by the way, are from close friends of our family. They're from the mainline evangelical Protestant church of, of, um, of Congo Brazzaville. So he was a school inspector in the north of Congo, and he was, um, he was at his office one day at work, and he heard a commotion around his house. So he went over there and found a crowd gathered around a, a, a dead girl that was lying on the ground. She had died about eight hours earlier, and they had, uh, she had blood smeared in, in all of her orifices. They, they had um, taken her to various local healers first to sacrifice some animals and smeared the blood in, in her uh, eyes, her ears, her nose and her mouth, trying to resuscitate her somehow, and it didn't work. And so they brought her to Albert Besuesue, saying, well, maybe your God can do something. And he said, you should have come here first. You need to turn from all these other gods and turn to the true and the living God. He bent down and prayed for her. She came back to life. And it was uh, such a phenomenon in the village that later on, before they'd moved out of that village, it was Etumbi, um, they, they, another child died and they came to get him, but he was out of town. So they got his wife instead and she prayed. And in this case also, the child was raised. Now obviously it doesn't always happen, but uh, it happened in those cases. A number of claims from India, a number of claims from China. Um, some of the ones from India, there was one where a government official's son lay dying. This was among the Nishi tribal people in the Northeast. And the, uh, the, the, son, the son was dying, and they, they tried everything. They tried um, medical help. They tried praying to different deities, sacrificing to different deities. And the pharmacist said, well, why don't you pray to Jesus, the Christian God? He raised somebody named Lazarus from the dead. So... The official found his son dead, and he said, Jesus, the Christian God, if you raise my son, I will become your follower. And he prayed, his son was raised from the dead, and that was the beginning of the people movement, well-documented people movement that uh, began to spread among the Nishi tribal people. Vast numbers of them turned to faith in Christ. Two Western sociologists were interviewing locals, including a Hindu village elder, about a woman returning to life after being pronounced dead when a Christian prayed for her. Another Indian pastor prayed for a girl who was dead with worms coming out her nose. She shared her post-mortem experience. The local newspapers covered it. Uh, so it wasn't just Christians who knew about it. Among doctors, we also have reports of this. One of them is from a cardiologist, West Palm Beach, a man named Jeff Markin checked himself into the hospital with chest pains, collapsed in the emergency room. They tried for 40 minutes to resuscitate him, and finally they, they called Chauncey Crandall in, the cardiologist who was making his rounds elsewhere in the hospital, to just pronounce him dead. So he came in to pronounce him dead, and he, he, went, he went back to his rounds, and he felt the Holy Spirit leading him to go back and pray for this man. So he came back, 
uh, the nurse was sponging the, the body down. Uh, Dr. Crandall told me he laid hands on the, on the man's head and said, God, if you want this man to have another chance to know you, please raise him from the dead. And then uh, turned to his colleague who had just walked in with him and said, shock him with the paddle one more time. And the nurse was looking at him like, Dr. Crandall, you have lost your mind. Shocked him with the paddle, and this is, of course, appropriate. I mean, he's a doctor. He should use medical means, you know, whatever means are available. But he shocked him with the paddle one more time. Immediately, the heartbeat was normal. And the nurse began screaming, Dr. Crandall, Dr. Crandall, what have you done? <clears throat> but in, in, in some of his extremities, it already turned black. I mean, he was not just dead, Dr. Crandall said, but very obviously dead. Uh, but he, 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 was, he was raised. And uh, Dr. Crandall went, went back into the, the uh, hospital uh, on, this was a Saturday. He came back on Monday. He was talking to the guy. The guy didn't have brain damage. Uh, I'm going to skip this one for the sake of time. Um, just, these are just some samples where we have some more medical documentation. Uh, this is not the real picture here, but I didn't have the real picture of her, so I used one from the internet. But anyway, Dr. Rex Gardner in his book Healing Miracles has a number of documented cases. One of them is of a nine-year-old girl who was deaf without her hearing aid. She had just been tested by the audiologist the day before. She was praying for her healing. She was instantly healed. The parents called the audiologist. He said, that is not possible. This is auditory nerve damage. This is not psychosomatic. This is not, you know, an ear infection. This is auditory nerve damage. It doesn't just go away. He tested her. He said, I have no explanation for this, but she is completely healed. There are eyewitnesses, some of whom I know personally, who testified the healing of deaf Muslims in Jesus' name in Mozambique. This became such a big deal that there were certain areas that were uh, on, on the government maps were considered Muslim areas that are now considered predominantly Christian areas because they would, they would pray, the people would be healed, they'd start a church the next day. And it, 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 it led to massive church growth from the people who knew these people who were deaf and were no longer deaf. It's now been documented with some medical tests. It was documented in the Southern Medical Journal in September of 2010. You can, as you can imagine, there was a big flurry on the internet and there were people saying, ah, the testing conditions weren't adequate. You know, what could you do under those conditions in Mozambique? They did the best that they could, but uh, Candy Gunther Brown, who was one of the authors of the study, uh, answers the critics in her um, publication, uh, Testing Prayer, published by Harvard University Press in 2012. And I, I read it, I read the critiques. I think she has the much better argument. When you read what actually went on in these studies, she makes a very strong case. There are other academic works uh, published by Oxford and so on, a book on medical miracles with Catholic medical miracles. Uh, there's been, of course, a lot of work done on Lourdes. This is the he healing of a broken back from Dr. Nonyam Numbere. Uh, and th there are a number of these, but I'm trying to focus preferably on the ones where I have pictures or something to show you. Carl Cockerell, he was on a vacation in Missouri. He was from, uh, from Michigan, I believe. And he broke his ankle so badly that the doctor kept him overnight, put a cast on his ankle, kept him overnight. While he was in the hospital, he believed he had a vision of Jesus uh, who told him he was healed. Uh, the, next, the next morning, the doctor discharged him, said, okay, you need to see your, your home doctor when you go back to Michigan. So his wife drove all the way back to Michigan. Uh, they got back, and his doctor there ordered uh, an, another uh, x-ray, another radiology report. And this is a week later, the new radiology report says, uh, you know, the doctor looked at it, he says, not only do you not have a broken ankle, you've never had a broken ankle. So he showed him the first report. The doctor said, now that's a broken ankle. Joy Wanifred. Say something. Testing one, two, three. Something. Testing one, two, three. We are set, which is uh, testing one, two, three, in Chinese, I think. 
she was, she had vertical heterophoria, uh, and the condition was so classic that she was actually uh, the one that at the time was used in the pamphlet for, to advertise the condition, vertical heterophoria. She, uh, she had constant migraines because of this. She had to wear very thick glasses that would keep out the light and had a certain prescription for her glasses. Uh, she was a student at Taylor University when uh, another student was praying for her and she was healed. And, you know, she'd had this condition for years. She went back to her doctor, um, who was a specialist in vertical heterophoria. Her doctor said, well, this isn't a miracle, you know, because her doctor didn't believe in miracles. But she had to give her the documentation that she was healed because uh, she needed it for a driver's license <laughs> to show that she didn't have to wear glasses anymore. She now had 20-20 vision. I wish I had 20-20 vision. Uh, but we have, we have the, the documentation. But by the way, um, I, I had to block out the, the, the reports I have have the names of the doctors, but I blocked them out because it's not courteous for, and I don't know the HIPAA laws well enough to know if I would uh, be in trouble, but it's at least not courteous to give uh, all their names in public. But anyway, uh, there was a medical trainee in North Wales, and this is also from Rex Gardner. She was dying in the hospital. She was healed completely after prayer. Even her eye scarring disappeared. It's all medically documented. There's no naturalistic medical explanation in the med school. They still, uh, there, they still talk about this experience. Lisa Larias, she had bones that were deteriorating from bone cancer. She was healed instantly. And not only did the condition not go further, but her bones actually were healed. And again, that's not something that happens on its own. Now, sometimes people ask about, well, uh, what about limbs growing back? I don't have very many, well, I found reports of that, but they, they were not accessible to me where I could go interview the people. So uh, I haven't included those. Um, they're mentioned in the book, but they're not mentioned in the section where I, I could document things uh, in any way. You know, I believe God can do that, but we don't see them in the Bible either, so um, we, we just don't have as many of those uh, as, as far as I've seen. But we do have some things that might be considered analogous to that. In other words, visible miracles. And actually, there are some that I was persuaded of where uh, there were large gash wounds that disappeared uh, overnight. And... Uh, there was one case of a, of a withered leg that, that filled out over the course of like an hour or two. And, and there were some other things like that where I thought they were persuasive, but it wasn't like, a, you know, uh, here was the, it was all cut off at the elbow and suddenly it grows out. I don't have anything like that. But um, Wansuk and Julie Ma, Wansuk is the director at the Oxford Center for Mission Studies. There was someone that they prayed for who had a large goiter, and the goiter instantly disappeared in their sight. Uh, and actually, I have a number of reports of that. But uh, one of Hume's issues was uh, a witness that is, has a lot to lose. Their, their, their reputation is at stake. They have a lot to lose from making these claims. And when I wrote the book, I was figuring I have a lot to lose from in making an argument that miracles happen because... That wasn't, I didn't think that was very welcome in the academy, but I've been, I've been surprised, and maybe you know, what Gary was talking about, about the, the decline of the naturalistic worldview has been partly a reason for that. But anyway, um, they, are, they are credible witnesses. <clears throat> um, someone else I know, he was a Moravian pastor, Douglas Norwood, and this, this happened in, in Suriname, where... Um, there was a, a skeptic who was challenging them at the church. He was, he was, uh, he had an arm that had been paralyzed all his life. And, and he's, he was shouting, I defy this Christian God. And suddenly his hand shot up in the air. You know, he was like in his 60s or 70s, his hand shot up in the air that had been paralyzed all his life. And he looked at it. He was converted. The people around him were converted. And this was the beginning of a people movement among uh, predominantly Hindu people 
in Nickery, Suriname. Uh, and you can, you know, there's documentation for the, the people movement. Uh, I'll give one more of these, and this was from Danny McCain. He's a friend of mine. He's spent about 30 years ministering in Nigeria. But with Danny, um, I figured he'd have some reports from Nigeria of miracles. He says, oh, I can give you one from the U.S. When I was a boy, my family, uh, we were praying for my little baby brother who had been scalded all over with hot water. And they sent him back from the hospital, but, you know, the hospital, they had to remove his clothes because his skin was tearing off when they were trying to take the clothes off. And he was just crying and crying. His skin was all, all red and uh, burned all over. And he said, while, while we were all praying, I noticed that my baby brother had stopped crying. And I looked up, and he was crawling across the floor, and his skin was perfectly pink, new, like nothing had ever been wrong with it. And, and he was fine. Uh, there are just a few reports of nature miracles I want to give. Emmanuel Atopson from the Evangelical Church of West Africa. Uh, he has a lot of stories because his father was planting churches in northern Nigeria. Uh, he, was, he was my closest friend uh, besides Jesus. He was my closest friend uh, when he was in seminary. And he uh, actually became my colleague t teaching Hebrew Bible after he finished his Ph.D., uh, at, uh, at Palmer Seminary when I was teaching there. But Emmanuel, when he was a boy, his father had just gone into a new village and rainy season was about to start and he didn't have the roof on his house yet. And so the neighbors were making fun of him. They were laughing at him. They were saying, look, everything you have is going to be drenched. It's going to be ruined because look, obviously it's rainy season. Look, the rains are coming. They're on the horizon. Everything's going to be ruined. And his father got really mad, and he said, it's not going to rain one drop of rain on this village until I get the roof on my house. Well, that was going to take about four days. And they just laughed at him and left. He fell on his face before God and said, oh, God, what have I done? <laughs> Please, for the honor of your name. But for the next four days, it rained all around the village, but not a single drop of rain fell in that village. And those people who knew what rainy season was in their, in their region, by the end of those four days, there was only one person in that village who had not become a Christian. Watchman Nee has a similar account of, of nature miracles. Uh, I'm going to skip the, the others uh, and just say something that I've seen directly. But, um, of course, nature miracles are usually not, not dismissed as merely psychosomatic either. What I've, what I've seen directly, it's not as dramatic as some of those, but just to give an example of something that I have, have seen directly myself. Um, it was around 1983. I was a fairly new Christian. I was, I was in college. I was helping out at a, uh, a nursing home Bible study when the... Um, there, there was this woman named Barbara. Every week, she was saying, I wish I could walk, I wish I could walk. And finally, one day, the leader of the Bible study walked over to her, and he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And he lifted her by the hand and began walking around the room. Now, I stared horrified. She looked horrified. If faith is a bias, neither one of us can be accused of it. And I don't think it was psychosomatic for that reason, but he, but he walked around the room, and, and she was still scared. But from then on, Barbara could walk. And, you know, you can say it was psychosomatic, but how would, how would he have known that? Um, back then, I wasn't planning to write a book on miracles, so I didn't think of getting any kind of medical documentation. But, um, and, and there are other people who were there who saw it as well. Um, but what struck me in particular, I mean, some of these things you could say, okay, maybe that's a coincidence, maybe that's a coincidence. You know, maybe this raising from the dead thing, well, you know, every once in a while you think somebody's dead and they, you know, they're stiff, their eyes are rolled back in their head, uh, they're cold, even though it's a tropical climate, they're, they're cold. Maybe, maybe it's just a coincidence that they, you just thought they were dead and they started breathing uh, and, you know, no breathing detected before, no heartbeat detected before, but suddenly they start breathing uh, when you pray. 
So what would you give that? Would you give that one chance in a thousand? Uh, but when I started talking with people in my immediate circle, people I knew, there were about 10 of these in my immediate circle. So what is one in a thousand 10 times over? Uh, I mean, they, I, I don't think the odds of this are very good for coincidence that these all happened just when somebody prayed in the name of Jesus. So I think my, my time is, is up. And, uh, or do I have what, like one minute left? No, okay. <laughs> my time is up. Please join me in thanking both of these men for the presentation. I'm actually going to ask both of you if you if you just come up here and just stand stand at the front. Um, we do have a few minutes for question and answer. Um, they're going to ask the questions and you have to give the answers. It's a bit of a reversal, um, but uh, I'll let the two of you share this particular mic. That's um, what we do in my classes. You know? well, uh, we we uh, we professors we ask we ask the questions and then and then find out if you were paying attention. That's exactly right. I think this is good. Uh, so, if you have any questions uh, for either gentleman, uh, just raise your hand and we have uh, some, some guys at the back who have microphones so that everyone can hear clearly what the question is. Uh, so please, any questions at all? There's one there. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Keener, I think you alluded to something, and uh, Dr. Habermas, you ha may have as well, I'm not sure. But for decades, um, at least among uh, P Pentecostal missionaries and pastors taking missions trips, we've had the phenomenon reported of ministers who would go from this country, where there's an established church and so forth, into an apostolic church planting type setting. And with no additional, co necessarily, uh, additional consecration or prayer or fasting in their preaching of the gospel and planning of the church where the name of Jesus hadn't been heard before, they would see unusual supernatural confirmations, uh, miraculous things. They would come home, they would not necessarily continue to see that in the same manner. Um, and we've also heard stories of how that after in those church planting situations, the church was planted and established, sometimes there would be a decline in the number or nature of miracles. But if those churches continue to evangelize and plant in unreached areas, the phenomena would recur with the same intensity as in days gone by. Has this been your experience and do you have any explanation for that? I think, I think God is sovereign. You know, we don't make the miracles happen. God does it and God gets the credit. But he's honoring the name of his son, Jesus. I mean, we're, we're hearing all these reports. And some of, the, again, there are people I know who've documented a lot of these reports and have experienced these things about visions and dreams happening, uh, especially in, in Islamic communities, where Jesus is revealing himself to people. I, I didn't cover this slide, but one of my students, uh, a Baptist student, at, at Palmer from North India, he, uh, his church grew from a handful of people to about 600 through uh, mostly Hindus coming to faith in Christ by being healed through, through prayer. And the way I found out about it was I had a splitting headache. I, came, I, I was coming back into seminary. He said, oh, let me pray for you, brother. He prayed for me and nothing happened. I said, it's because I don't have any faith. He said, no, brother, it doesn't seem to work here. But, you know, if you come to India and you pray for people, they'll be healed because God is so eager to show these precious Hindus his love for them. Now, it can happen here too. I mean, God works through medical means. We, we, have, we have an abundance of that that many parts of the world don't have as much of. And that's, that's God's gift to us as well. Um, and an answer to prayer doesn't have to be dramatic like, you know, somebody blind, uh, instantly seeing or something like that. Um, it can be much less dramatic. But the signs and wonders in the Gospels and Acts, they were to get people's attention. That was the function, usual function of miracles, as, as well as an expression of God's compassion. And the signs and wonders in the Gospels, they were signs of the, of the kingdom. So they're in a sense of foretaste it's not a panacea for all the world's problems. It's not meant to do away with hunger and, and uh, 
the need for health care and things that we're supposed to do our best to take care of. But it's a, it's a, it's a sign, it's a promise, it's a, it's a foretaste of the coming world when there'll be no more pain, when there'll be no more sorrow. It, it's a sample, not, not to heal everybody, but just to let us know that in this world of suffering and pain, there's a, there's a, a hope for the future. But I think something that goes deeper than the miracles that we see in the Gospels is the message of the cross, because it shows us that even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of suffering, God still has a plan. God is still at work. I, I got off of your subject, but, um, but it, is, it, is, um, it is true that it seems to happen, especially the more dramatic ones, seem to happen more in certain kinds of settings than others, which may be also an incentive for us to be about the business of proclaiming the good news of Jesus. Uh, you had, when you were met, talking about David Strauss, you were talking about uh, Jacob uh, Christoph Blumhardt. Yo, yo. And th there's a historical account of his work in Germany in the 19th century called The Awakening. And in that book, uh, one of the things that seemed to be connected with the signs and wonders that were happening all around that area of Germany was confession of sin one to another. Do you, have you seen any connection between um, a tendency to, to confess our sins one to another and healing miracles? Um, James chapter 5. Although, um, what we, well, the definition of miracles is a big, big issue, but in terms of healings, um, James, James 5 talks about confessing your sins one to another and um, in, in connection with uh, prayers for healing. Blumhardt, it's interesting because Bultmann knew about Blumhardt. Um, Karl Barth uh, drew on these accounts of Blumhardt from the previous generation as, as accounts that God is at work in the world. Moltmann has even done that in his work on hope, is drawn from Blumhardt. Moltmann said, ah, these are just crazy legends. But we have the journals of Blumhardt. We have, we have letters from that time that document, historians can now document, these are not legends. These are things that eyewitnesses claimed happened, including a couple raisings from the dead and a nature miracle. Question there? What would you say to people that enrich themselves with healing ministries? If they're getting, it's interesting. Is this one to me also? Or, oh, uh, people getting rich off of healing ministries. I'll say anything. Um, yeah, to me, I don't think that sort of argument, I, I would have given that argument myself for many years, but obviously it's true. I don't think it counts for anything in an argument. And the way it doesn't, the, re the reason it doesn't count for an argument is let's say we admit every, and you may not have been using it that way, but let's, let's say we admit every single fraud case. Someone's making money, somebody lied, somebody misperceived something. Let's say every single case is used for false purposes. But false purposes, unless you can disprove every single case, it only shows that people abuse things. For example, today with the new atheism, one of the chief arguments against Christianity is, well, I'll tell you what I call it. I call it the Christians can be jerks argument. <laughs> Atheists use this all the time. I know this Christian, he won't put his money where his mouth is, he won't help people who are, you know, hurting, and if he won't give to do, and, you know, why should I believe in his God, and so on. Well, I think not only can Christians be jerks, the Bible teaches that Christians are jerks. We call it sin. 
and we're supposed to come to the Lord and confess it and change our lives. But just the fact that people are jerks doesn't prove that people who aren't jerks are doing the wrong things. So there are definitely negative cases. There are definitely misuses. Don't forget there were misuses in the New Testament. Remember Simon the Sorcerer in the book of Acts? Go see what he says about it in his commentary. Um, <laughs> but remember, he, first of all, he thought he could do all those things. And then he said to Peter, when he could see Peter doing, having more power than he had, he said, I'll pay you to give me this. Notice again, let me, let me pay you for this power. And Peter said, your money perish with you. Uh, you're, you're no part of us if that's how you think, you know, if you, that's what you think this is. So there were always cases in Scripture. The, the little girl who was uh, trying to prophesy and Paul cast the demon out of her and then everybody was mad because the guy lost his means of making money for, you know, her forecasting his future also in the book of Acts. There's always cases like that all the way through. I think what we have to concentrate on are the, are the, uh, best ones. And, and our definitions of best, by the way, are going to change. I told you I have a list of Craig's miracles in his book that really make me, that I really enjoy. And uh, my list isn't his list. He had a few on the list. By the way, that one with the cardiologist, you can watch it on YouTube. You can watch that case of the guy who died in the office. And what he didn't tell you, he implied it, but what he didn't tell you was when they shocked his heart, you, you almost wonder, well, why did they shock his heart in the first place? They had. They had been shocking his heart for the 40 minutes, and nothing happened. And when he said the Lord told him to go back at work the first time. Um, so I, I think uh, my head has been turned by the kind of data. Maybe my favorite account, told Craig over dinner tonight, maybe my favorite account is one where a, where a little child had a club foot. That's a little bit close to me because I fell in my department. The guy who hired me, he had a grandchild with two club feet, and they had to take him in and operate on him, and everything was successful. But a lot of times atheists do say, show me something that grows right then and there while you're looking. And the minister prayed for this child. The doctor said, I was cheating. I kept my eyes open during the prayer, and I watched that little club foot open right in front of my eyes, and they did not have to do the surgery, and the child was healed. And you have the doctor's testimony in the book. So, I mean, people misuse things, but I want to know what we do with the positive data. Is, 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 that, is that answering your question? I can't, I, can't, I, I shouldn't try to address him because I've never watched him and haven't really researched him, but, um, but, I, but we do know from the Bible that there are a lot of people who say to Jesus in that day, have we not prophesied in your name and in your name done many miracles? And Jesus will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity. So uh, I, I can't comment on that particular person, but it is interesting that the that the connection between healing and prosperity that's pre preached in some circles now, throughout church history, the connection was actually kind of the opposite of that. You know, it was people who lived simply, I mean, which is what you have when Jesus sent out the disciples to, you know, he said, heal the sick, and do all these things, don't take any money with you, <laughs> and so on. And then it was about the 1950s that that began to shift. Uh, to an emphasis on prosperity, too. Now, in some circles, what people seem to mean by that is God providing their needs, their desperate needs. But in a lot of circles, it's just become... It's just become a theological justification for what a lot of materialistic American Christians want to do anyway. Is there a question over here? Um, trying to frame my question. Um, quite often, healing miracles like this like, that you talked about are, um, and even in those instances, did this as a sign of, you know, this person is from God or God is with them, you know, and it brought about many believers. Um, what would you say about claims 
of miracles and healings among Muslims, non-Christian groups who make the same types of claims around the world in different places, you know, and how would you compare the two and, and you know, because it, then it, it's like, well, they're making the claim God healed through me and therefore that, you know, God is with us. That, Uh, you know, I, I will just, I'll tell you what C.S. Lewis said in his book, Miracles. Lewis said, I used to think that I had to disprove all the miracle claims and all the non-Christian religions. But then I started thinking, why should I? Why should I? God can do whatever God wants to. And, you know, it's, it's funny. On one side, we say... Well, God's not a God of tolerance, or God doesn't, you know, God's this or that, or why did he command the Israelites?